قل إن كنتم تحبون الله فاتبعوني يحببكم الله ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم والله غفور رحيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه والتابعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وبعد يقول الله عز وجل أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم فانطلقا حتى إذا أتيا أهل قرية استطعما أهلها فأبوا أن يضيفهما فوجدا فيها جدار يريد أن ينقض فأقامه قال لو شئت لاتخذت عليه أجرا قال هذا فراق بيني وبينك صدق الله العظيم As we were going through the um, sequence in regards to the Surah Al-Kahf and the Fitna of Dajjal Of course You've probably heard these stories many times, especially the ones that are in Surah Al-Kahf. Many people are attractive to it and they hear and they attend programs where these stories have been mentioned. Um, the third story, as well as the third, the fourth question that the people of Mecca, which they brought from Medina to the Prophet Wasallam. The first one was about how did, the, how did Bani Israel ended up in Misr when they were with Yaqub alayhi salam. In, in, in Palestine. And on that answer, Surah Yusuf was revealed. The second question was about ruh, the soul inside the body. So the answer that Allah gave in regards to, in, in, in regards to ruh, the soul in the body, first of all, ruh is a command of Allah. So if a command of Allah is there, it's found. If the command of Allah is out, it's not there. As far as your investigation is concerned, or how do you want to describe this? You have been only given a very minute amount of knowledge. So due to the small amount of knowledge that you have, you will not be able to grasp the reality of this command of Allah, which is known as ruh. The third question that they asked about the Ashab al-Kahf, who were they, how, why did they go to sleep, what is the story of them? The fourth question they asked was about the incident between Musa and Khadir alayhim salam Now, Musa and Khadir, of course Khadir alayhi salam was not just found in the time of Musa because he was found in many other aspects, many other aspects, many other times. And in fact, there is a narration in Musnad Ahmad. وَصَحَّهُ Imam Ahmad رَحِمَهُمُ اللَّهِ Ahmad ibn Hanbal has mentioned and he has take, taken the authority of his authentication and sihha. And he says that Khadir even came and he met Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that narration can be found in Musnad Ahmad. Easier access is Ruhul Ma'ani under the commentary of this ayah. However, so we know for a fact that Khadir, he just not did exist in one time. He existed in many different times. And I mentioned to you yesterday that why he had ended up having a long life because of Ma'ul Hayat. Hayat. Now, the third thing is, was he a prophet or not? Allah Azza wa Jal mentions to Musa alayhi salatu was salam that when Musa alayhi salatu was salam he stood up in Bani Israel and he said to the people of Bani Israel he was addressing so a random person stood up and he said man a'lamu nasi fi wajhi al-ardi ya Musa that O oh Musa who is the most knowledgeable person at this current junction in this world so Nabi automatically has the most knowledge amongst the people. So in regards to that factor, Musa salam replied that it's me, I'm the Prophet of Allah. And then after me is, is, is Harun, is my brother. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he deals with his special people in a different way. And the terminology of the, the muhaddithun they use is, Hasanatul Abrari Sayyatul Muqarrabin. 
It's a very complex sentence. I'm trying to dissect it for you and put it into a simple way of understanding. Hasanatul abrar, sayyatul muqarrabin. Hasanat means good deeds, abrar means righteous, sayyat means bad deeds, al muqarrabin means the close ones. So the good actions of the righteous can be not appropriate actions of those who are closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because these are special people, so Allah deals with them in a special way. It doesn't mean that it's a sin. It's at the end of the day is hasanat. That's why is hasanatul abrar. It's the good deeds of the righteous. But those who are close to Allah and the prophets are the closest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah azza wa jal want them to be the example on the face of this earth. Because Allah has given them, they are qudwa. They are the ones that others will follow. So if there are any deficiencies or there are any things which are not appropriate for a Nabi, even though for a regular person it's completely fine, but it's not appropriate for a Prophet, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes them to a training. So this was the training that Allah azza wa jal gave Prophet Musa alayhi salatu was salam. When he referred the knowledge towards himself, Allah says no. You go and you start traveling. This was the call, the journey of ilm. The journey of ilm. Imam Bukhari left his house at the age of seven. Imam Bukhari in the journey of ilm. The journey of ilm is very beautiful. Because in that journey, ilm is given to you on the aspects of your, of your sacrifice. Knowledge is given to you on the aspects of your sacrifice. The more sacrifice you give, the more knowledge Allah gives you. And what's the key point of having more knowledge? It's not reading a lot of books. Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu says, Man amila bima alima wa rasallahu ilm ma lam ya'lam. If a person practices what he knows, Allah will give him that ilm which he does not know. So ilm increases on practice. Knowledge, this is why a sahaba, their ilm was great, but their amal, their action was even greater. Their ilm was great, but their actions were, was greater. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inspired them and Allah azza wa jal selected them. So however, this journey of Musa was the journey of knowledge. He took one of his students with him by the name of Yusha bin Nun. That was the student of Musa alayhi salatu was salam. So the shaykh and, and the student, they are traveling for this journey of knowledge. And Musa alayhi salatu was salam told his student that Allah has ordered us to go on this journey, so we are going on this journey. And then many things happen. There are many hidden um, pearls that you can take out from this story. I'm not going to go into details because many of us know the story itself. And the detail itself will even take her on the longer path. And my, my object of, of mentioning this is to create a link between this and the fitna, the trials and tribulations of Dajjal, the Antichrist. So we don't want to deviate from our, from our, from our path. So however, this journey of knowledge was taken by Musa alayhi salatu was salam. Now this Khadr, as I mentioned, raised the question, was he a prophet or not? Many of the scholars believe, and they have the opinion that he was a prophet, but not a regular prophet. Because there are two types of prophets. An nabiyyu tashri'i wa nabiyyu takwini. Now this is something that's going to be very difficult for you to probably digest. A prophet which has been sent for the rules and regulation for individuals to connect them to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Which is known as sharia, law, the law of the almighty Allah, how to practice it, what to do, what not to do, things which are halal, things which are haram, so on and so forth. That's called an nabi al-tashri'i. This Nabi is coming with the Sharia. He's coming with the law of Allah. He's telling people what to do. The second type of prophets that Allah Azza wa Jal has sent into this world is an nabi al-takwini. 
these prophets are there that they take care of, take care of the situations of the world. All the prophets that came before Nuh, Adam, Idris, Sheath, all of these anbiya, they were an nabiyu takwini The first sharia that came was to Nuh alayhi salatu wasalam. So when we have the count of anbiya, 124,000, according to the most famous narration, and the second narration Qurtubi has mentioned in his tafsir, 246,000 anbiya, prophets that have come into this world, these are the combination of both the prophets, tashri'i and takwini. Those who brought sharia and those who Allah sent to take care of some matters of the world. So Khadir was part of those prophets. He was amongst those prophets who were given tasks to take care of certain things of the world. That's why in the story, he kills a child, he makes a boat, he, he, he creates an, a fault in the boat, and he goes and he fixes the wall. The prophets are not sent for these purposes. Prophets are sent to show, show people a path. But he's doing all these work that Allah has specifically sent him for because these are the taqweeni anbiya that Allah has sent. Idris alayhi salam, Idris, he's one of the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He created many things. And in fact, uh, the Mufassirun, right, he was amongst the taqweeni nabi. He came for the purpose of, of fixing the situation, teaching people what to do, how to do it. What things are used for what purposes? The world does not just find out, people did not just learn at the time when they came out from the womb of the mother that, well, we're going to use this thing for this purpose. There was someone there because Allah Azza wa Jal says in the Quran in Surah Taha that Allah Azza wa Jal mentions that who is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Rabbuna alladhi a'ta kulla shay'in khalqahu thumma hada. He created everything and he guided. He guided people how to use it. So every creation of Allah, including human beings, they were guided by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There are two types of guidance. The first type of guidance is how to use certain things of the world, which things are beneficial and which things are harmful. So of course, it was required in the beginning of the time when the first human being starting to come and exist on the face of this earth because they didn't know what to use and what not to use, what are beneficial things and what were not beneficial. At that time, Allah used another system of anbiya that came and taught people this is a beneficial thing, this is a harmful thing. These are things that will give you benefit, these are things that will give you harmful. That these are things that will give you harm, so on and so forth. So, so Khadir was amongst the taqweeni nabi and that's... The, the point that I wanted to make here, and this is what the Mufassirun has written in regards to this situation. Um, if you want to go into more deep of, of, of this understanding, of course, there are many aqwal and many statements um, that has been mentioned in regards to this, so you can go and deeply look into tafasir like Ruh al-Ma'ani, Ibn Kathir, and Qurtubi, and, Aksar, uh, and, and other tafasir of the Quran, of other commentaries of the Quran. Now I wanted to create the link between this incident and the fitna of the jail. Amongst the fitna of the jail that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala informed and Rasul sallallahu alayhi informed to the people that he would come and he would have a knowledge which other people would not have. And he will claim to do things which other people are not able to do. And he will tell you information about things that you don't have or you have. He will tell you, well, I know your father. Accept me as a God because I can have you make communication with your father. Your father was this person. He did this. So the information that they don't have or doesn't exist right now, this person will start collecting it and he will have it. And in today's world, it's a very easy task. And the greatest example is the, the chaos outside. You just swipe your card and you put a donation, all your information is already stored. So they can send you a receipt at the end of the year for tax deductible purposes. So you swipe your card and all your information is secured. Where you live, where did you go, where did you travel, how often you travel. So today's world is very easy to understand. And that type of, and, and, and for Sahaba it was difficult. Oh Prophet of Allah, how would he be able to do that? For us, it's very easy to understand from those ahadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that he will tell you about the information that you don't have or has been passed about your family, about your history, about everything. 
So when you enter into the homeland security area, when you come into the country, and when they swipe your passport, there is a chip in that passport. As soon as they swipe your passport, all of your history, how many times you even visited the hospital, they have that in there also. Easy access. So that is easy to understand that how would he have information about whatever you are doing and in fact what you are and what, how, how your things is. As technology progresses, everything becomes visible. Everything is under monitor. Everything is, is being seen. So I don't want to go into more details on that, but just as the information is concerned, he would have such information and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us a lesson from this story of Musa in Khadir that we can derive a lesson from this to protect ourselves from this fitna. And that is tawadu'. For ilm, you need tawadu'. Tawadu' means putting yourself down, putting yourself lower, having humbleness inside you, showing yourself humble. Because ilm is the sifa of Allah. Knowledge is the quality of Allah. It's the sifa of Allah. It has generated from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah in his that, in his personality, Allah is ulu, is always going up. His majesty is great. So when you get peace of the sifat of Allah, this greatness comes inside you. Ta'allamu al-ilm wa ta'allamu lil-ilmi al-waqar wa sakina Majma'u al-Zawaid, fifth volume, bi akhrajahu al-Tabarani. Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said on the authority of Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, go and acquire knowledge. But to maintain that knowledge that it can guide you toward the right path, you need to bring waqar and sakina, humbleness inside you, hikmah, wisdom inside you. You need to lower yourself down. Don't show yourself that you are the one. I am the one. No. Because those who possess the knowledge and they have gone, they don't show until when it comes to the time when they are put into a situation, then they expand their knowledge. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, a'lamu nas ba'd al-anbiya. The most knowledgeable after the prophets. But how many hadiths that we know that are narrated by Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu? Very few. But when the humanity, when all the Sahaba, they were complexed in a situation that where would we bury the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam after his demise? Where the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam would be buried after his demise, after his passing away from the world? Some say let's bury him in Baqiyah. Some say let's bury him in Mecca. Some say bury him there. At that time, everyone is in a confused situation. What's the answer to the problem? Abu Bakr stood up and he said, Inni sami'tu nabiyya sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I have heard the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say, wherever a Prophet dies, this is where his qabr is. Wherever the Prophet passes away, this is where you bury him. So he passed away in the hujra, in the, in, in the room, and in the house of Aisha radiallahu anha, and this is where he was buried. That's called ilm. Al-hadir inda al-mudrik. When you want it, it's there for you. Otherwise, it's just information. It cannot save you. It cannot protect you. So for ilm, you need tawadu. You need humbleness. Why? Because otherwise, they say, if you don't control your fame, it becomes, it becomes a flame. If you don't control, if you can't control your fame, then it becomes a flame. And what does the flame do? It burns. It destroys, it finishes, it wipes out, it perishes. And unfortunately, those people who don't have that type, then what happens, that fame becomes a flame and it starts distributing and it starts destroying. And what does it destroy? It destroys human being. This is why Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Yakunu fi akhir zaman Amongst the time of the day of judgment, amongst the signs of the day of judgment, there will be some individuals that will come on the face of this earth. They will wear the libas, they will wear the clothing 
of the people who know, learned individuals, ulama, scholars. وَأَلْسِنَتُهُمْ أَحْلَى مِنَ السُّكَّرِ their, their tongue will be more sweeter than the, the sugar itself, sugar coating. You know, you take a stool, a piece of stool, you know, all, all due respect, and you sugar coat it. You sugar coat it. What happens to it? Does it become a candy? No. But unfortunately, what happens? Those people who think it's a candy and they eat it, when they realize, they spit it out. And these are the type of people that Rasul has warned that Yakunu fi akhir zaman. Rijalun yalbisuna siyab al ilmi. Al sinatuhum ahla min al sukkar. Wa kulubuhum kulubu al diab. Yakulullahu azza wa jal. Abi taqtarun. The Prophet said, during the time amongst the signs of the Day of Judgment, there will be these sugar-coated people. From the outside, they are sweet like, like, like sugar, but from inside, they are wolves. It's like a stool which is sugar-coated. Allah Azza wa Jal addresses them and He tells them, Abi taqtarun, are you trying to deceive me? Are you trying to deceive Allah? Or you're trying to challenge Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is hadith Qudsi. Allah azza wa jal then says, Allah says, I take the swear of my honor that I will send such trials and tribulations upon that time on the ummah. Even an intelligent person will be in shock what's going on. What's happening around the world? Tawadu, to protect yourself, humbleness from this fitna when it will acquire, when it will come. This is why a person, he needs to bring himself. The Sul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, so you study the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Amongst the great qualities that he had, the one exceptional quality was even though he was a great Nabi, but he always considered himself amongst the common people. When he was walking with the Sahaba, the sun came, one of the Sahabi lift up his sheet, try to cover his head so the sunshine does not affect the Prophet Sallallahu Nabi Sallallahu said, I want to be a regular person. I don't want you to worship me, I want you to worship Allah. I want you to worship Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, when he became the Khalifa, before he became the Khalifa, he had this special talent of milking the goat. So many of the girls in the city, they would go and take their goats to Abu Bakr and Abu Bakr will make these nice tricks in milking the goats. Now, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, after the demise of the Prophet sallallahu he became the Khalifa. So now one of the small girl, while Abu Bakr was walking, he said, now he has become the Khalifa, he would not milk our goat. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu looked at that girl and he smiled and he said, that a girl make dua that the Khilafat does not change Abu Bakr, I will still milk your goat. I will still milk your goat. The Khilafat would not change Abu Bakr. No matter how great status Allah will give me, but at the end of the day, you will find me the same Abu Bakr as I was before Khilafah. That is Tawadu. And these are the people that we need to learn from. May Allah Azza wa Jal give us the ability to bring these qualities into our life. And may Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala. These are the walking Quran. These are the walking Quran. Having Tawadu, having humbleness in your life. May Allah make us amongst them. Ameen Ya Rabbal Alameen.